Well, good morning. How are we doing so far? You know, it's been a great morning. My name is Alex, and I'm one of the pastors here at Fellowship Bible. And I know CJ has already welcomed you, but if you are visiting with us, you're a special guest. Now I can see your faces. Awesome. Um, we're glad that you're here. And, and I do hope that uh, you'll attend that starting point class. I know some of you have been coming around for the last couple of months since the beginning of the year, uh, maybe even last fall. And, uh, and we'd love that you're here with us on Sunday mornings, but ultimately we'd love for you to take your next step and get plugged into the life uh, of our church. It's, it's fun to be here on Sunday mornings and gather with a large group. It's even better uh, when you plug in to community and really get to know people on a deeper level. And attending Starting Point is just kind of your next step in doing that. And so uh, we hope that you'll register for that. You'll get to meet our staff. Uh, we're all there. Uh, like CJ said, we're going to feed you a little bit. If you've got kids, we'll take care of the kids that morning too. But there's nothing more than we'd rather do than just see you take your next step in your faith journey. And we'd love to be a part of that here at Fellowship. So I uh, would love for you to register for that if you haven't. Uh, and if I haven't met you yet, I'll be out in the lobby uh, after the service. So um, please come say hi and introduce yourself. Um, I have a quick confession, a little pastoral confession before we jump in uh, today. My first three or four years, as a, some of you thought, that was pretty serious. <laughs> I think some of you thought, what's he going to do? What's he going to say? Uh, my first three or four years... As a lead pastor, as a senior pastor, not as associate pastor, but when I was in a role as a teaching pastor and teaching pretty frequently, which started about 13, 14 years ago, uh, when I first started that journey uh, in, in pastoring and teaching a lot, I avoided the subject of money and tithing and giving. Like, I just didn't want anything to do with it. I avoided it like the plague, you know, it's just like, I'm not going to even touch that. And, and here's why. There, there was kind of two primary reasons. The first is, even though I, I planted a church, whether, whether there's 15 people in the room or 50 people in the room or three or 400 uh, like that are in here today, uh, I just always firmly believe that there is someone or some ones in the room that are skeptical. Like you're just skeptical about faith. Uh, or the church, maybe you've even been hurt by the church before, uh, and so for whatever reason, uh, I just didn't want to talk about money because I just figured that, that that crowd, those people, already think the church has a reputation of what all the church wants is your money, uh, and so uh, I, I just thought, you, you know what, I don't want to give anyone a reason to not listen to the gospel. So that was one of the primary reasons. The other primary reason, or the second thing, is I was naive enough to think uh, that if people were being saved, if there was a lot of excitement and things were happening and there was momentum and attendance was growing and new families were coming and there were visitors and uh, even around here at Fellowship right now, we had a Galentine's event with over 50 women on Friday night, Saturday morning at our men's breakfast, there was like 62 men that were there. I just thought, man, if things are fun and exciting, that giving and people tithing to the church out of that excitement, well, that, that would naturally happen. And that is not always the case. And so for several years, uh, I just didn't see the point in talking about money and giving and tithing. And what I finally realized was this. If I didn't preach about Money. If I didn't talk about those things that the Bible talks about, in particular that Jesus talks about, then I could potentially put us in harm's way. And what I mean by that is Jesus talks about money a lot, and yet it's hardly ever about money. I mean, we never see that Jesus takes, ever one time in his ministry, that he takes a financial love offering. Like when he's out ministering, it's not like he ever once passed the plates. Like never. Uh, Jesus never led a capital campaign. He never built a building for ministry. Never did it. Churches do it all the time. Jesus never did it. Um, Jesus never once hosted a car wash uh, or donkeys were the mode. A donkey wash, uh, a spaghetti dinner. Uh, whatever it was, to raise money for a mission trip or to send his disciples 
out into the field. And so I just spent many years making excuses, avoiding the subject of money and tithing and thinking that I was trying, as incredulous as this may sound, uh, to protect the gospel by not addressing what Jesus uh, so clearly addresses in Scripture. And I realized that that's not preaching the whole counsel of God. And not preaching the whole counsel of God could potentially put you and I in harm's way. And so if you have your Bible, please turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. This morning we're continuing our series in the Sermon on the Mount. And we've come to a passage here in chapter 6 where Jesus is talking about treasure and money, but it really has nothing to do with money. I mean, you're very quickly going to see that Jesus is not coming after your checkbook. And that just feels like an outdated term, by the way, doesn't it? I don't know the last time I've written a check, but Jesus isn't coming after your checkbook, your bank account, but rather something more valuable to him and something that he actually came and died to claim, and that's your heart. And so right here at the beginning, there, there's going to be two commands. Now, there's a negative command followed by a positive command, and so we're just going to pick it up right where we left off last week in verse 19. Jesus is on a hillside, on a mountainside, teaching his disciples, and he continues his sermon, he says this, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. Let's just pause right there. Um, We call this a negative command because Jesus right here tells us not to do something, right? That makes sense to us. So let's just flesh this out a little bit. Jesus is saying that the point of your life, the goal of your life should uh, not be to lay up for yourselves treasures here on earth. So um, think um, trinkets and toys and, and trophies, and, and by the way, listen, this is not a spiritual argument. I mean, it is on some level, but it's just a very common sense argument. And here's the common sense argument that I think Jesus is going after here. If accumulating things is the primary goal uh, of your life, then nothing in life is in your favor. He's like the earth wages war against you and your stuff. I mean, I don't know if you thought about this, but everything that you own, everything that you own is in the process of moving toward a garage sale, an estate sale, perhaps a family heirloom of some type, or it's moving toward the garbage dump. I mean, like, that's what's going to happen with your stuff, right? You don't get to take it with you. And so... um. Jesus is just saying, hey man, everything that you own in this life is in the process of losing value. And and some of you intellectual types are thinking, well, what about gold or what about Bitcoin? Well, I mean, well, you might be right to a certain point, but under the right set of circumstances, even gold, diamonds, and Bitcoins are worthless. And so Jesus comes along and he's like, hey, don't do this. Don't spend your life accumulating treasure because not only does the, the earth wage war against you, he's like some people might even try to steal the stuff that's on the way to the dump. Have you ever stopped to think about this? Like, have you ever stopped to wonder why stuff is so intoxicating? I mean, has that ever popped into your brain that new stuff creates a motive, an emotive response in us. I mean, think about it. It's just like, how can we possibly think like this new car is going to make my life so much better? Um, These new clothes just, they just make me feel better automatically. I'm just a better person because I'm better dressed than I was the day before, right? I mean, new stuff, they just, it makes us feel like a better human being. New gadgets, new toys, the latest iPhone, whatever it is, they make us feel more put together. Isn't that absurd? 
what new stuff does to us, it's intoxicating. And we're addicted. And we buy stuff not because we need it. We buy stuff because we're addictive to the emotive response that it produces in us. I mean, if we're just being honest, right? I mean, we are perpetually believing the lie that what we need to be happy, uh, more happy and more content, is more of the stuff that we already have. And Jesus says, stop it. Like, that's madness. Don't do that. That's the negative command. And then in verse 20, he just flips the whole thing on its head, and it's a positive command. Look at this, verse 20. It's just a replay with only a couple of changes. Look what he says. He says, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. And so the major difference between these two verses, other than in the first verse in 19, he said not, and this verse he's telling us to do, the other major difference is the, uh, the word heaven here and not earth. It's the place. The issue is not whether or not we are going to store up wealth. The, the question is where are you going to store up wealth? Jesus is saying you ought to put your money in the first national kingdom bank of heaven. But like, what does that even mean? I mean, if that were even possible. Like, e even if we understand practically the words of Jesus here, like how do we obey them? How do you make a deposit on earth for dividends to be paid in heaven? What, what, what's going on here? Well, here's what I believe is the answer. You store up treasures in heaven by investing your money and your time in things that will last for eternity. I, I, I believe that that's what Jesus is getting at here. And, and when you read your Bible, the Bible lines up some pretty easy ways for us to go about this. Like, um, as Christ followers, we live open-handed lives. We, we care for the orphan. Um, we care for the widow in distress. I think we read scripture and we realize that our lives are to be marked by generosity. That there's a call to outdo uh, others in honor. It's like we are people of the kingdom. We are salt and light. And because of that, then we're open-handed. And we're investing in what is eternal. Not into things that are transient. We shouldn't be investing in stuff of future garage sales and estate sales, right? We should be investing in stuff that lasts forever. That's what we're to be marked by. And then as we look at this next verse, here's where we're going to get a pretty clear picture that God's not after your stuff, that, that God doesn't need your stuff, okay? Listen, this is not about God's needs. Can I just tell you something? God does not need you to fund his mission, do you get that? Do you understand that, that God does not need your money? He does not need your stuff? This is something that you and I are invited into. Look at what Jesus says. I mean, this is so profound. Verse 21, he says, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I want to camp out here for just a minute. Because um, I grew up, like, from the age of 12 on uh, in church, and I just believe that most of us, at least I was when I was young, was kind of taught the wrong, like, interpretation of this text. And so if I were just to try to rephrase this, and, and Jesus did a pretty good job, um, but if I were just to try to simplify it and rephrase it a little bit, here's what I would say. Your heart follows your money. I mean, if we were just to boil it down, your heart follows your money. Like, that is not the way that most of us have been taught to think about this verse. See, we tend to think that our money follows our heart. And Jesus says, nope, doesn't work that way. It works the other way around. Your heart always follows your money. And in this context, it either follows it all the way up to heaven or it follows it down to earth. 
And since your heart always follows your money, it only makes sense to put your money in places where you want your heart to be. That like what he's saying is, is it's not show me your checkbook and I'll tell you what's important to you. He's like, if you'll start investing in something, then that thing will become important to you. Like so many people will come to church and just talking about tithing. They're like, well, things aren't exciting there yet. Or maybe, you know, we used to print uh, uh, our financial status weekly and, and, you know, our bulletin. And so people would look at that and they're like, ah, this church is always in trouble. I'm not going to invest my, my money there. And Jesus says, no, invest. And when you start investing in something, you start spending money in a certain area. He says, then your heart follows that. Then you become passionate about that. You don't get passionate about something first and then start spending your money. It's the other way around. And so he's like, man, if your treasure, if it's in trinkets, and if it's in toys, and if it's in trophies, if it's in your stuff, in your house, in your cars, he says, if all of those things are what's most important to you, then your heart's going to be there in those things, in that place. And let me be clear, there's nothing wrong with wealth. There, there is nothing wrong with nice houses, nice cars, nice clothes. None of that is sinful or a problem in and of itself. It becomes a problem when those things own us, when they define us, when it seems like those are the only things that we're living for, when we find our identity and meaning in life in those things. And listen, this is a, a principle that extends beyond money. I mean, th this principle extends to your time. I see so many families make huge time commitments so their kids can be involved in sports or travel teams or maybe it's dance or maybe it's theater, or whatever the case may be. And then they do those things so much so that those things become more important than church activities or belonging to this community. Or sometimes that investment of time just comes at the expense of, well, just good, healthy family time. And so hear this. Again, Jesus is going after our hearts here. And I think what he's saying is whatever is uppermost in your affections... Like, what, 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 wherever you're setting your heart, whatever is uppermost in your affections is your God. It's your idol, and it will shape every area of your life. And so Jesus comes along, and he's like, hey, let's not do that. Let's not spend our money um, and put our treasure in things that are on earth. Let's invest in heavenly things. Like, get your heart and your mind on me. And then look at this next section. He continues, verse 22. He says, the eye, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. So, so just to make this really simple, because that's like a lot of eyes and bodies and light and darkness <laughs> going on there. Here's what, what he's saying, if we just condense it down. Since where your treasure is where your heart is also, you, you should be very mindful and very aware of what you value as supreme in your life. Like what is primary let me try to explain it this way, and I just I want to chat with the husbands and fathers in here for a moment, because we are more inclined uh, than women, and, and some women do this, but men are, are more inclined to find our worth and our identity and our work and how much money we make. So um, let me talk to you guys for just a minute. Men, by all means, go climb the corporate ladder. Like, sincerely, 
uh, go be a CEO, go be the CFO, uh, go be the president, the chairman of uh, the board, like wh whatever it is, go be an entrepreneur, have multiple streams of income. Like, go do those things. Go as far up that ladder as your gifts will take you. Just do not lose your integrity in the process. Don't lose your integrity and don't sacrifice your family to get there. In all the years that I've been a pastor and I've had the opportunity to counsel with uh, maybe high school students, college students, young adults, I have never, ever in my life counseled one young person, been talking to them who's had relationship issues with their parents and ever said something like, you know what, as a kid, I'm just so furious with my parents because I never had what all the other kids had. Now, when you're a kid and, you know, your friends are getting the latest thing, of course you feel like you're missing out. But I'm just saying the older that you get and you start getting into adulthood, I've never one time counseled any young adult that's like, I'm just furious with my parents because I just didn't have Air Jordans 10 years ago when I was 16. It just doesn't happen. You, you, you know what I found is those kids who are most put together and, and have a healthy worldview are ones where dad was around. Mom was around. That they weren't in pursuit of the things of this world. They weren't chasing the almighty dollar. Let's love our families well. Because what happens to us if in our hearts what we think our family needs is stuff. And we sell out to that, just thinking that's how we're going to love our family. And when we do that, you know what happens? You lose the one great privilege that you've been given concerning our family. And that's giving them not presence, but your presence. Some of you didn't grow up with nice things, and so here's what you do. Man, you are killing yourself trying to give your kids something that you didn't have. And instead, you should be loving and shaping your children into who God would have them be. It's the difference between investing your time of things here on earth or in heaven. And, and then Jesus closes this section out. Um, he's going after our heart again here. Look at this, verse 24. He says, no one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. And then emphatically, he just says, you cannot serve God and money. And so again, just boiling this down, simplifying this, if your treasure is on earth, you have to defend and protect and put a lot of time and energy into that treasure. And what God's saying is your heart gets divided. When you do that, your heart gets d divided between heaven and earth. When the heart is divided, all this vitality and, and energy that was granted to you for freedom and for joy, when you, when you invest in things in earth, man, it just goes into anxiety. And, and in fact, he's going to tell us that next week. It, it, it's funny that, not funny, it's just ironic that the next thing he's going to say next week has to do with anxiety right after talking about where you store up treasure for yourself. I just feel like this text, these seven or eight verses here, there's just, when it's all said and done, it's a call back to what really matters. Like, this is a call away from regret and into gladness of, like, pouring yourself out in the things that you have and own and your time and energy and effort, pouring those things into things that actually matter, things that are eternal, things that are very much gifts of grace, like your church and your family 
and your kids and your wife. I mean, this is not about money. Jesus is saying, I want your heart. He's after your heart having a singular purpose, not being divided. Because you cannot serve God in money. So you're going to love the one, despise the other. You will forsake one, cling to the other. But you cannot be faithful to both. As we preach through this series, here, here where my mind has gone. Um, this has been the focus of my heart. What if j- just the people of this church, um, just starting here in, in this room, what if the people of this church actually started living kingdom-centered lives? Like, like living our lives the way that Jesus has been teaching up to this point in the Sermon on the Mount. Like what would happen if the Holy Spirit did something remarkable among us and in us and through us if we actually surrendered to the things that Jesus is talking about here? I, I, I mean, just by review like what what if we took our marriage vows seriously to the point that there was no divorce like there was just no divorce in, in this room in our flock in our community of faith i mean can you imagine that they would send sociologists and researchers here to study us what if there was no anger to be found among us? What if we only spoke to one another and to our spouses and to our children and to our friends in a loving and God-honoring way? What do you think would happen? What if we didn't lust after things of this world? What if we invested our time in the things of the kingdom and eternity? What if we became an incredibly generous people? What if we became so generous to the point that it was like easy to take advantage of us? I mean, I would rather be known for being easy to take advantage of than stingy any day. Guys, there is a community outside these doors waiting for a people who live the way of Jesus to spill out of these doors and into our neighborhoods and into our streets, loving them the way that you and I are loved. I mean, I'm hungry for that. I, I, I get excited about that. And I love what God's doing here, but if we're ever going to make an impact in this community, it's just not going to happen within the walls here. It's when what happens here maybe starts here, but, but then carries on out. That's the stuff of eternity. That's the stuff that we're going to remember. I mean, just this morning... Um, you know, I, I was reminded that, that we had a great Galentine's event uh, Friday night. I think that's great. A lot of men at breakfast uh, yesterday morning. And you know what trumps that? I had a deacon come to me this morning and say, you know what? I shared Jesus with one of my son's friends, and he accepted the Lord this morning. Like this morning. That wins every time. That's the stuff. That's, the, that's storing up treasures in heaven. And so may we be a people who love to gather, who, who love to exhort one another, who show up each and every week to encourage one another. But may we be encouraging one another to go do the things of heaven. And live kingdom-centered lives. Would you pray with me? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes for just a moment? Oh, 
Well, Father, I thank you um, that you've engaged us this morning with the, um, the tyranny in our hearts to love trinkets and toys and um, trophies. That, Father, sometimes we're drawn to the things uh, of this world. And, and so we're grateful that you're bringing that to our attention. That we'd be aware when the things of this life are just trapping us. And so I thank you that you want to free us from dozens of things that enslave us. And you want to allow us to walk in freedom and life and joy. God, I pray... Um, that we would be a people marked by generosity, marked by compassion, marked by faithfulness, that you would do a profound work, not just in this church, but God, I pray this for all churches in our city. And Father, may the areas of this city that are wrought with crime and, and poverty and all the people that don't know you, who face an eternity without you, Father, may we be people who address these issues, engage these issues. And God, may you pour yourself out in such a way that your kingdom will become visible in this city. Father, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray all this in the name of the one who taught us how to pray. In the name of Jesus, amen, amen, amen. Um, thank you for coming today. I, I want to invite you back next week. I, I hope you'll come back. We're going to discuss overcoming anxiety, and uh, I'm going to share from my very own battle uh, with panic and anxiety. Uh, it's a, a struggle I know firsthand and all too well, and so I'm going to share that story with you uh, next week. So I want to invite you back for that. Uh, if you came today and you're here and you just want to pray with somebody, uh, maybe uh, God was speaking to you this morning, maybe the Holy Spirit was just nudging you and making you aware that, man, you, you are caught up in so many things of this life and this world, and you just want to pray that, maybe, maybe that confession just helps you feel uh, a little bit better, and you want to share that with somebody, pray with somebody, maybe you came in with just something completely different going on in your life and some struggle, and you just want some encouragement and someone to pray with you. Here at the end of the service, some of our prayer team members will be down front here. Uh, and, and so after we read our benediction together, you can come down here and they would love nothing um, but to pray with you this morning. And so with that being said, would you stand with our uh, prayer team, come forward, and let's read this benediction together. Father, help us to live this week to the full, being true to you in every way. Jesus, help us to give ourselves away to others, being kind to everyone we meet. And Holy Spirit, help us to love the lost, proclaiming Christ in all we do and say. Amen. You're dismissed.